All right. So, okay. <coughs> our, our goal here is a very easy to heart conversation about what would be easily available for people to understand uh, and thus ease up even conversation. <coughs> so with that intention, Ray? Yeah, you're going. I'm going, OK. So to, the topic today is uh, addictions. And the addictions are as usually defined. And then we'll define them unusually. <laughs> so let's now see all of this. When we say addiction, what does that mean? In, in the field of psychiatry. Um, well, there's, different, there's different definitions, but one of them is um, persistent, compulsive, Dependence um, could be either behavior or on a substance because addiction can range from things such as drug use, alcoholism, but it can also go to you know, sex addiction and things like that, also. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't introduce myself and I didn't ask you either. I just jumped into an addiction <laughs> of doing things. Um, so, my name is uh, uh, Chadri and I'm at C. Clear. And then we do these roundtable discussions about a topic of interest which affects many people in general. And so in, uh, in, in conversations with our uh, panel here, and uh, would you introduce yourself uh, to the panel? I'm a PhD student from Stephen Hill. So you just kind of give the wisdom of what your prediction really means. Um, you want to add something to that? Um, sure. Uh, I could do the physiology of it. Mm -hmm. um, like and introduce yourself. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> My name is uh, Taylor Golden. I'm a physician assistant student from St. Francis University. Um, so the phys physiology of it, um, we feel good when neurons in our reward pathway release the, the neurotransmitter dopamine into the nucleus accumbens and other brain areas. At this time, also GABA is released, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that works to present or prevent the receptor from being overstimulated. Um, and addictive substances increase the amount of dopamine in our synapses and um, heightening the feeling of pleasure. And addiction occurs when repeated drug use disrupts the normal balance of brain circuits that control reward, memory, cognition, and it ultimately leads to compulsive drug taking because you need more of that substance. Um, the same Wonderful. So, what happened at the brain level that it changes and the behavior needs to be happen? Um, I think, sort of, like she was talking about, you get the dopamine release, and eventually your brain starts making, um, I think they're, they're proteins, I can't remember them, but it makes proteins as you keep continuing taking the drug, and those start taking over receptors. So, in order to get uh, the same effect that you had before, you so the brain actually changes. Mm -hmm. Remember, we have been talking about the neuroplasticity, and the neuroplasticity you know, really change the brain, brain adapts to whatever it's being subjected to. So no different than as we are, you know, I find, you know, we were bowling for the week, and I haven't bowled in a while. So my, my different muscles, which ordinarily would be available for bowling, were not quite available. Uh, and I knew that. But then I had about three strikes. So I think hmm, those muscles are coming back to action. So the brain area which were developed for a happy, balanced place uh, in, 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 in regards to, say, relationship excitement, you know, in, in excitement of looking at a beautiful picture, excitement of succeeding in life, are now being used in the total service of a substance which then become the total focus and everything else to outside. So the people are focusing on addiction. And then because uh, they're very powerful. So among these substances of addiction, uh, what is the most addicting chemical and why? Anyway. The most addicting chemical that I have come across would be nicotine. Okay. And why? Nicotine is the most widely abused drug on the planet, which is legal and easily available, and once started, there's a couple, 
questions a person can ask themselves. If when trying to stop, you cannot quit entirely, or if when using gambling, whatever, you have little or no control over the amount, the duration, intensity, frequency, and duration, then you may be looking at getting some out. All right. So at a biological level, then, a substance that gets into our body very fast. So nicotine goes through absorption to the lungs, right? But it's very quickly absorbed to our bloodstream and back to our receptor and nicotine. Right? So anything that people would ingest would have us less chances of addictive compared to anything that we inject. Right? So inject or other mechanism. The quicker access to our body and the more quicker action of the receptor site, the more habit form. There's one more reason why a thing could be highly addictive. What would that be? Habit. Habit. The quicker a substance gets out of our body. So the, the half-life of a of substance. The more robust it is, the more quickly it gets out, the more habit forming it is. Because then we are chasing our tail. So something which is lasting in our body, say, you know, three days versus three hours. You know, there's a difference. So we call it biological availability. You know, how quickly it is absorbed, how quickly it acts, and how quickly it gets out. So things like heroin are highly addictive. Those people inject, and it gets into the body very quickly. It does its excitement very quickly and gets out very quickly. And then we are trying to find it more. Does that make sense? And so many people will graduate or work at a time, they start using marijuana, alcohol, and they gradually get into more harder drugs to get the same effect. Having <laughs> said that, what are some of the criteria set that we have to recognize before we say somebody actually has uh, abuse of a condition or dependence of a condition? Who wants to work here? Um, I could do this. One hearing or in one So abuse, the DSM um, has a criteria for it. DSM which one? Uh, five. DSM five. So it's very important to remember that we use the latest research, latest you know criteria set. The DSM five, as we know, is the latest uh, criteria set that we have to be able to make certain diagnoses, and we are using that. Um, so they define it as a maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment of or distress as manifested by at least three of the following in the same 12-month period. And the four being the three of the four of are um, recurrent substance use, substance use resulting in failure to fulfill major role, roles or obligations, such as work, school, or things at home. Uh, recurrent substance use in situations in which it is physically hazardous. Uh, recurrent substance-related legal problems or continued use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by the effects of the substance. So everything goes down the brain, the work, the relationship, the dignity and respect, and we get into using a chemical in favoring uh, in, in lieu of the usual excitement. This was substance abuse. Substance abuse. So what's the difference between abuse and dependence? Dependence is. Sure. Okay, there's. Okay. Abuse. Um, it's a maladaptive a pattern of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress as manifested by a through the following of time in the 12 month period. Tolerance, withdrawal. Substance taken in larger amounts over a longer period of time than originally intended, desire to cut down or regulate, or efforts to control or use are unsuccessful. Great deal of time spent obtaining or using substance or recovering from its effects. Social, recreational, or occupational activities are given up or reduced. Failure to abstain from using despite evidence of negative effects, which is um, negative effects on the health of the family. Absolutely. So let's then make it real. In our everyday life, you know, would you, you have some somebody that comes to your mind uh, who would be, be struggling with an addiction, and how that would present in real life? Yes. 
young man who has been coming uh, to uh, counseling for about a year. And, and this individual has been unable to work. He's been unable to uh, go to school. He's been unable to keep uh, long-lasting relationships. He has been unable to manage his temper, for example. And so uh, on all areas of his life, the social, work, education, it's been very, very impaired. And whenever he does come to counseling, oftentimes he's very guarded in, in his uh, willingness to uh, shift into a healthy lifestyle. On one hand, he may say he wants to. On the other hand, he finds uh, the gap from wanting and doing the right. So my primary focus has been really in the gap with him, to see what resources he has inside of himself. Uh, he does participate in the subboxing program here. And so I'm very interested in his inner resources. Well, let's look at how does that make you feel when the thing that he says he wants to do and he doesn't. How do you as a clinician feel? So, well, Peter and I had a a uh, treatment planning meeting, and let me see his uh, aunt was in, in the room, I was in the room, he eventually arrived, and Peter was there as well. <laughs> I, I have to say, it's not funny, I talk to myself, it's not funny. I find myself very frustrated. Frustrated, so let's stick with that, frustrated. Frustrated. And then, how, how do you translate frustration into real emotion? Well, the real emotion is my primitive, my primitive brain is very active, and you know, frustration can lead to anger. So, the reason I wanted to highlight that was, you know, that not only we as caregivers may feel a person's inability to follow through their own wanting, how would that affect the family members, the husband and wife, and the schools, and the teachers, and the employers? How would they respond to somebody who had addictions? They, re they respond, they're baffled. They, they respond with resentment. They respond with anger. They, they respond with withholding their love. Trust, respect is gone from that individual. Isn't that beautiful? That we have somebody who's struggling with addiction, and then the very people that they would find support from really isolate them. And then in the religious affair, you know, when people have a certain spirituality, how do you think people get treated in that that way? If somebody has addictions such as narcotic dependence or alcohol dependence, right then? How do you think people um, time to time I suspect they're labeled as being sinful. Sinful. Isn't that wonderful? It just makes it just keeps getting better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so because how do we view uh, why and the reason I want to bring that up is you know, how do we view addictions? In our normative cultural, from through the through the eye of normative cultural paradigm, it is not considered to be normal or socially acceptable. So that that sets a tone. That sets a tone of how do we view people with addiction? I can't help remembering. There's a wonderful line in My Fair Lady where Professor Higgins says with a certain amount of frustration. Why can't a woman be more like me? He, of course, is male. Translate that to addiction. Why can't an addict be more like us? And the answer is because they're different. And again, they're, they're the family's thoughts, the people who love them. Why can't you stop? Can't you see what you're doing to yourself? Can't you, you see what you're doing to us? Right. So, so I'd like to add to the fact where Peter is just leading. We define addiction then, and that's where at Secure, we define addictions outside of the norm of everyday usage as well. I would define addictions to, to behaviors such as if some people are unable to change their lives and they eat a lot, or they're gambling, or they're doing things such as uh, you know, uh, sexual uh, you know, uh, kind of preoccupations. Uh, I, I also Look at even people who work too long and too many hours, that's an addiction as well. An addiction to something 
that we do excessively overtly and keep on doing it in, in spite of adverse effect. Right? So, so in my view, having been in the field of psychiatry for some time, almost everybody who is walking around has some addiction. Unless two or other ways. And then we have one, one or the other addiction, and we can have good addiction, or we can have unhealthy addiction. Some of my friends here think I'm addicted to PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> and that is accurate. You <laughs> 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 meet the DSM-5 criteria. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there's a call through a little bit of bag just for that. I, I think that all I need is a two minute map and I could give them up forever. <laughs> this is all epic <laughs> <laughs> Uh So now that we are kind of playfully talking about addiction, that was my in in interest to make it more playful. A very serious matter can be made playful but can become very groggy and more and more and more painful and we want to make the recovery and getting better at the playful process. So let's kind of talk a bit, maybe before we do that, um, you had prepared slides for the incident and those kind of things? Not um, so much. And, well, um, only a couple of points regarding incidents. Um, the, um, I didn't get a chance to, I know the sure. first time you information, I didn't get a chance to. Um, Alcohol is the most commonly abused psychoactive agent in this country. You know, that's a point of incidence. It depresses the central nervous system, and as these ladies have pointed out, it activates the reward circuit. Um, it's also, of course, legal and widely available. Um, and there are a number of meds that can be used to combat it. Okay. So that's a good part. So let's then a part to look at uh, another substance that is uh, we see in our practice a lot mm -hmm. that we use treatment for. Maybe we could talk a bit about the opioids for a second. Sure. And what are some of the things that we see on an everyday basis here? Um, as you suggested earlier, uh, one pattern uh, of entry, so to speak, is kids in high school experimenting with marijuana, which then leads to a need for more powerful substances. And uh, frequently, uh, the second step is pain meds of one sort or another. And then they become very expensive, and the kids end up using uh, heroin because that's cheaper and produces some of the same. That's one mode of entry. Another is, uh, and frequently involves, highly productive, uh, responsible people. They go for surgery, uh, they prescribe pain meds, and uh, one, for one reason or another, the surgeon doesn't warn them that pain meds can be quite addictive. And that pattern then becomes a dependency, and the dependency turns into an addiction. And we see these people, uh, not because they sort of wandered into it for recreational reasons, but because they simply weren't properly advised at the outset. Um, and um, uh, a third pattern, and we've even had medical providers in this pattern, the stress of their schooling and their work is such, and of course they have access to most of these substances, they begin to use on a casual basis addictive substances to reduce stress and to get through the day. Yeah. Uh, that's a third pattern of entry into the area of dependence. So, so that's great. So we see a lot of that in our everyday clinical practice. So maybe we can name some of the, I know Peter also have prepared what are some of the other sub common substances that people end up using that are called addiction in the tradition? Caffeine. What's that? Caffeine. Caffeine. Oh. <laughs> Alcohol. We've talked about that. Stimulants. Stimulants, such as? Uh, Adderall. Ritalin. Ritalin. Stimulants can become highly addictive. Anything else? Nicotine. Nicotine. Food. Food. So yes, food is great. Now I'm going to stick with the, you know, the usual scenario for a period of time. 
Uh, anything else we see, Rutan? Did you mention marijuana? Marijuana, right. right. Cocaine, okay. amphetamines, and yes, which are, which are stimulants, which unfortunately people who have weight issues often turn toward stimulants for weight. So, so as of teens, and they also become an increasingly important area. So, so if we broadly look at these, you know, various compounds, alcohol and benzodiazepines, which really include Valium, Xanax, Ativan, and the sleeping medicine, you know, most of them. Uh, in the olden days, we have the barbiturates and all that. But they fell into that category. We call it sedative hypnotic. Alcohol works exactly the same manner as do some of these, these chemicals. Then there are stimulants. So cocaine is a stimulant of the sort, so are the other, you know, the amphetamine, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then we use the opioids in a class of medicine. And the opioids generally include from heroin, but naturally happening medicines and so forth. So there are the opioids. Uh, so, and then we kind of touched on the caffeine and the nicotine as, as a they have the additional kind of element. So we'll kind of stick with that. But we'll kind of pick two, which is the most commonly heard thing, the alcohol and and, and the uh, and the narcotics, because we see that a lot. So I would kind of say, um, maybe give us a little insight into the alcohol. Uh, you know, how do people present with alcoholism? People present with alcoholism. Normally, if an individual is asked how much they drink, I've learned from Dr. Chaudhry that you usually multiply it by three. <laughs> I have a uh, question of personal. What's that? Personal? Sure. Well, generally, you know how, so how, how it affects their lives and how they're most commonly presented in you know, mechanisms to a clinical setting. In a clinical setting, most of them come in, they're having, they're having issues with relationships. They're sometimes it's either or. They're given an ultimatum by their family or by their employer. Uh, finances. They, they have issues. They have issues with finances. They have issues with personal health. They're they're isolated. Sometimes the state police take an interest as well. Yes, they come in here because they have they have legal issues, DUIs, uh, physical. Violence, fights, health—they—they they present with uh, a lot of times. With Dr. Shagra, they come in and they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Because there are so many things happening in their life that the glamour of using is no longer working. The glamour of using anything that has been been in their you know their, their life is no longer effective, and it just becomes a burden. Then a benefit or relief or something. Okay. Um, so, so how do we treat alcohol? Um, there's a drug that works well called antabuse, and um, that is more or less to help them stop craving it. Because if you take the drug and use and you drink alcohol, you get very sick. So it's this to help you deter from wanting alcohol. So, okay. so you're rather than getting happy and relaxed and go to sleep, you start going up, and so fun to be going up and puking all over, right? So that's a not any tender book. <laughs> right, so that's, so we're not talking about the, uh, the pharmacological intervention. So you picked up the interview as one. And we do that at Ciclair. Uh, so at Ciclair, we kind of, kind of use the sciences of medicine, the sciences of uh, therapy, the sciences of integrating and working with trauma and everything, and healthy living as a lifestyle medicine uh, to be able to allow people to return to good health. So, medicine is an integral part of that. What else do we do? What can we We are going to stick with the alcohol that we do. Okay, uh, pharmacologically wise, there's other drugs that um, you can take. Camperol is one, and that's one um, as an abuse causes a somatic uh, response for your body because of vomiting and things like that. Uh, Camperol kind of decreases your cravings, mm -hmm. as well as drugs like Revia and uh, Bubitrol. And a uh, mechanism of those is they block the opioid receptors in your, in your brain, or the, um, yeah, and it will decrease 
a good place to work. Yes. When in doubt in psychiatry, always default to brain. <laughs> 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 Also, it reduces the reinforcing effect of alcohol and by, by reducing this, this uh, mechanism of action, basically. Okay, so we have these three medicines. What else can we use, pharmacologically speaking, outside of these three medicines? Not so counseling. All right, for counseling, we have two counselors sitting here, <laughs> and they'll give us a little insight on that. I know that Jim, you're prepared, but I'll have to get a little, you know, you um, and I share and see the patients who take care of the biological side. And he was also involved. Uh, I sort of bring him into our conversation talk in terms of counseling and treatment. Uh, this uh, young woman uh, gradually slipped into alcoholism accidentally by drinking with her mother to help her mother. So it wasn't something that she intended to, to happen, but it happened. And as life began to become more difficult for her in organizing uh, her children, homemaking, and taking the children to school and other activities, she, she came to see me. And it, and it wasn't too long into our conversation that she wanted to be detoxed. Yes, and, and so I talked with her about the options in patient Outpatient. And she wanted outpatient. And she chose that. And so I talked with you. Um, and, and Peter was involved as well. And so she decided to participate in outpatient detox. And, and she was committed to everything that was asked of on her side. And the amount of times that she had to come in to see you. And meanwhile, I'm seeing her as well. All I did at that point was to be supportive, and, and, and that I did. And her husband came in, he was supportive. Mother was not willing to come in. However, mother did not invite her to drink, so that did help. So at some point, uh, she went through the whole detox program, and she currently is on the camera. Yes. And what she is struggling with now is the Ratings are increasing. Yeah. And so we are managing this as best we can. So this takes into the and in medicine, field of medicine up until I would say 15, 20 years, there was a lot of coordination between clinicians. And thus there was a lot more good treatments. Mm -hmm. Now those treatments have gotten fragmented. You know, the counselor doing something, there's the doctor doing something, there's the hospital doing something, there's the primary care doctor doing something different, and there's not that coordination of care. So one of our fundamental principles is to coordinate care between providers. So as Ruthann, you know, talked about, you know, we coordinated care between the detox part that was done by medically myself and Peter. Uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Ruthann provided the support that was needed. Exactly opposite of what we ordinarily have when a person is drinking, you're sinful, you're discovered, you're out, you're outcast. We actually bring them in to become part of the fabric of their care and bring in built in the family context. We help families understand addiction is a very hard thing and therefore them to be able to work with them and know how to. So rather than enabling how to become more profoundly able to help them work through those things. Do you want to add to that? At Seclair, we provide a nourishing, safe, non judgmental environment where positive change is possible. One of the first things that we convey to an individual that there's hope. That there's hope. Yes. So hope and the medicine. Is that pharmacologically defined yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it, it is in it's not even in uh, DSM five. <laughs> <laughs> But then that, then that a tragedy. Hope is the first medicine, right? And hope for getting better. And and, and uh, we had someone that was seeing Peter and one of our clinicians here. And they said after having gone through different places and whatnot, that was the most engaging point. They felt that they were treated as human beings and treated with respect and given hope. 
typical that you know, really is so very important because people otherwise feel very hopeless. They feel so very good. He reported that same young man reported that he'd been to several places where basically he was severely criticized and humiliated at the outset for having become involved with drugs. That's right. So it's not that clinicians want to, we unknowingly do that. So we unknowingly create that environment of criticism and see people differently than us. And then practically, if we realize the other person is more different than us, it makes it easy. We recognize that. Uh, we, we get humbled by the fact that if I'm, uh, if I'm having a, you know, an issue, actually I know of two cardiologists who had their own heart attacks. They should have known that, right? Ordinarily, we would say that. You know? and, and, and then they say, you know what? I have not been practicing what I was teaching to other people. And I'm humbled by the fact that I have a heart condition. And now I know what it feels like to be sitting on the other side. So it's very, so very important to know that. You've often said, Dr. Chandra, that we cannot ask someone to do something that we have not done ourselves. And that we cannot take a person further down a path than we can. No. So the whole the pharmacological intervention, therapeutic intervention, what else can we do? There is um, alcohol anonymous that the patient may go to, or there's a this one group for the family members too. Okay, so there are family support meetings that we can do and so forth. What else can we do? Now we're getting into the treatment aspect from a lifestyle perspective. You know, we have done the pharmacology, person is attending a meeting, their family is attending Al uh, Al Anon, and everything fantastic. What else needs to be done? As the Claire, we deal with mind, body, and spirit. And at Seclair, we offer skill classes, dialectical behavioral therapy skill classes, where we not only introduce new skills to deal with mindfulness, interpersonal relationships, distress tolerance, and emotion regulation. We also help people unlearn old thought patterns and behaviors that were not successful. That's beautiful. So changing habits and lifestyle is so very critical because otherwise we can take away alcohol or drug abuse. Then what's left? What's left behind? And that has to be somehow made exciting and, and enjoyable. So recovery is not only just taking away something, but also giving something even better. And that better something should be so much better that you would not even want to go back to something which is not as good. And if you have a good meal, you don't want to go back to have a bad meal. Not rare, it's rare. It's rare. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what it's a good thing. <laughs> um, so, I've only been here a year. Yeah. <laughs> year, year. Uh, I found that you had developed a tree of, um, a tree of prediction, uh, or a tree of some sort. Yeah. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, Taylor and I found a picture. Um, you know, passing around. There's um, different parts of the tree, and there's soil on the tree, which can be physical abuse, spiritual abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, things like that, hereditary stuff that are kind of just laying there, like kind of brewing up. And then you have things which is the roots of addiction, which is loneliness, fear, shame, grief, anger, and things like that. And eventually it grows into a tree of addiction, which can um, include work, food, drugs, sex, things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So this will be available on our website. Uh, so these teaching rounds will actually then culminate in, in the science of addiction, the criteria for addiction, the statistics for addiction, some very cool, nice scientific, you know, kind of pictures of the brain and how it kind of behaves and, and what happened. And then uh, we will kind of offer hope and wisdom in small, simple bullet points. And we'll be posting these things on our website uh, on a weekly basis so that everyone can actually not only enjoy the conversation which are taking place, but also would have a take home thing that you, you could also enjoy and use that for your family members or anyone that you find of, of, of value and, and recognize you know, that these tips of science are the wisdoms of science. So we can be able to enjoy their the, the knowledge becoming our everyday uh, in a therapeutic uh, context. Now, I know that uh, Peter had prepared some 
slide that over. Was there anything that we missed? Not that not, be relevant. not really. I'd simply like to say that I don't consider PowerPoints to be sinful. <laughs> I'm attempting to get my colleagues to adopt that view. That's wonderful. So we will also be posting Peter's PowerPoint on the website. So in the event anyone has an interest in your downloading that information, they could actually you know, download that information. Uh, please keep in mind, there's a lot of work that goes into preparing some of the most difficult sciences to a very simple potential take-home points. Uh, but we enjoy doing that because it's in the service of community strengthening and community awareness. And, and should you find that of value in your personal life or the life of those that you care, please, please feel free to share. None of the things that we do has any proprietary kind of thing. It's, it's, it's in the service of community awareness, community strengthening, and so that our, our, our living become very mindful and joyful and active. Uh, I just wanted to kind of add uh, a comment to that. Uh, the field of psychiatry is getting into, we have the psychiatric so we'll be also kind of getting data about some of the most recent researchers in the field. So in the psychiatric times, we, we kind of looked at super agents, you know, uh, insights into the brains of 80 plus year old memory superstar. With a lot of you know, research going on, why people not only have a good life in, in regards to the quantity of life, but also quality of life. You know? So if you and I don't want to end up in a nursing home uh, you know, at age 60, and be asking for a glass of water. You're not being able to walk and talk and think and, and be able to do it. But we want to have not only the, the quantity of life, but the quality of life. So these conversations are about the quality of life matter. And, and in later time, we'll talk about the genetics and the genomics, how exercise, how breathing better, how living mindfully, how eating properly actually changes the quality of our gene and gene expression. And it's such a wonderful area of emerging sciences. And uh, so in this particular example, you know, as a person is coming out of their addictions, we will give them other remarkable ideas to get addicted to exercise, to eating healthy, to enjoying life, having some money in their pockets, and also climbing climbing through the hills of Western Pennsylvania and any place that you want to go. So that you're able to enjoy the the depth and the breadth of the value that the trees and the pristine lakes and, and the wonderful tricks offer to us. So they're so playful and so joyful. We just have to learn how to use them in the therapeutic context so that you're not worrying about how to pay your next co-payment or worrying about your health bill. Because watching a tree is very free and enjoyable. Right? Anything that we missed out in your a profession that would be valid rather than this profession. Okay. And I'll just kind of add for Suboxone that we didn't spend a lot of time in the uh, treatment aspect. Uh, at Sicklier, we offer treatments uh, such as Suboxone management. And there are a number of other things that we do for narcotic dependence. Uh, but that's one that's commonly known or commonly heard of. So I thank everyone for preparing the topic. And while we are together, maybe we'll pick up the topic for the next time as well. Uh, what we have not covered, we talked about depression and disorder, we talked about addictions, and maybe obsessive compulsive disorder and like the attack and panic attacks. Yes, so that you're not panicking about panic attacks. <laughs> <laughs> and again, in a similar manner, uh, for those who are part of the panel, I really appreciate your presence. You know, we can do the counseling aspect of that, some incidents, and some PowerPoint slides that you're not addicted to. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> this may be difficult for me. I know. <laughs> and having some of the wider and the data and the DSM wise, so we'll have to keep the same rhythm of our conversation about what can be very serious conditions, but we can make them playful and joyful. Thank you all. I appreciate everyone's participation, and especially for our IT folks who make these things happen. Uh, Swan in the background that nobody can see, but he's, he's visible to me. And all of us, and, and then Mike, uh, they make these things, which is a complex science for us, easy for us to do. So I appreciate both of you and the background and making these things happen. So thank you all. <laughs>